All right. So go on, go ahead and tell me why I shouldn't buy an iPad Mini three again. iPad Mini, well, not you. Paul Gannon is wondering. Oh, but, I um, can't. Paul can't. <laughs> well, you can do whatever you want. Um, actually, oh Paul, you can, you can do what you mean. I, I, I might. I know I might seem forceful, but you're actually, um, yeah. It's so the thing is, iPad Mini three is basically an iPad Mini two with Touch ID, and you're getting a machine that is a, a, a year behind already. So you're saying um, buy if you're going to if you have to buy one buy a 2 because it's cheaper. Well, no. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. If you want to buy, buy an iPad, iPad mini 2, yeah. yeah. Unless you really really want the Touch ID which is going to use be used on online only. Um Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's a tough choice actually, but the, the iPad mini 3 really doesn't look like a, a, a I great say thing. get a Nexus 7. All right. Um you ready? Wait, can I can I say something before you start? Yes. I don't feel chair like recognizes Ms. Josephson. I don't feel like I did the best possible job with the Yahoo earnings because <laughs> they didn't report their earnings like in a way that made me make it sensible. Oh. I mean, I, I wrote it down. It's a lot of numbers. And look I'm at sure. look while we're doing this. Look yeah. at the Recode version of it, Thank as, you. and then kind of see if there's anything extra. Okay. Or triangulate simple. it against that because there may be just not that much to it's say. Just gap. It's the whole gap. Blah, 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 you know. All right. I'm gonna, gap. You, gap. You, you start. All right. All right. Here we go. Ready? The daily tech news show brought to you by great friends like my hockey. Go to dailytechnoshow.com slash donate. Hey, Mr. Merrick, can I have my book? This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, October 21st, 2014. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining me, my co-contributor, Patrick Beja, DTNS King in the North. Uh, that East. is a title, I, I, yeah. East to, from, from you, but west from others that are really to the east. They don't also, really like royalty in your country anyway. So That is true. I don't want you to also end up under a guillotine. Co-contributor, does it mean that you're also a contributor? I thought you were the host. Well, it's getting I, very complicated. I, I, I contribute headline. and I host, right? <laughs> I true. like the company I like so much I bought it or, or something. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, Patrick Beige is here, and uh, we've got tech headlines to give you. So here we go. Reuters reports augmented reality startup Magic Leap raised $542 million in funding led by Google with a nice chunk from Qualcomm. Uh, this would probably be just another startup receiving another round of funding, and we wouldn't pay much attention to it if it weren't for the mystery around Magic Leap. Do you know the mystery, Patrick? I know it has to do with eyes and projecting things on into it's very clockwork orange. Uh, actually, very few people know what Magic Leap's product actually is, but CEO and founder Ronnie Abovitz has said Magic Leap will develop, quote, the most natural and human-friendly wearable computing interface in the world. And apparently, according to Reuters, the device will track your eyeballs and project images directly on them meaning that images appear within the natural world rather than being projected in front of you like in an Oculus Rift. Also, Sundar Pichai, Senior Vice President of Android, Chrome, and Apps at Google, will join Magic Leap's board after this fund. Yeah, that's also another sign that something is amok there. And I mean, uh, uh, half a billion dollars is for, for a company that we know nothing about for the product. It's a lot of, of money to invest into something that, uh, how much fundamental research can you do with half a billion dollar without anyone finding out what it's about? I don't um, know if it gets rid of your urge to take part in some of the old ultra violence, <laughs> which is exactly <laughs> what this sounds like to me. Like, uncle's got milk. Yes. It's all, yeah. Mm. It does not you know sound what? very horror show let's let's talk about something soothing like the federal trade commission <laughs> that's what soothe me <laughs> at pc world reports the us uh, ftc has appointed privacy consultant ashkan sultani as its new chief technologist beginning in november sultani is a security researcher who won the pulitzer prize for public service in 2014 along with discovered the us nsa surveillance programs 
Yeah, so he, so he did some Snowden stories. Wow. And he's mm -hmm. and he's worked for the FTC before too, so they like him there apparently. Hmm. Interesting. That's that's the kind of thing that makes you go, hmm. Which means it's interesting. This is why every time people say, oh, like the government would ever hire somebody like that, I'm like, well, sometimes they do. I know it may be <laughs> infrequent, but look, you know, Ashton's old time. Hiring a guy who worked on Snowden leaks on the Washington Post to be your privacy chief technologist. That's good stuff. Happens. Giga Ohm reports China denies any involvement in the man-in-the-middle attacks taking place against Apple's iCloud within China. The attack coincided with the launch of the iPhone 6 in China, according to greatfire.org. Swedish security researchers at NetResec said the attacks seem to be performed from within China based on the number of hops and seem to be being performed on backbone networks belonging to China Telecom and China Unicom. Hua Chenying, a spokeswoman for China's foreign ministry, told journalists the government was resolutely opposed to hacking and China Telecom also said the accusations against the government were untrue and unfounded. I guess we'll have to take their word for it. Nielsen, the company that tracks TV ratings, has partnered with Adobe Systems to measure viewership of digital video across all internet-connected platforms. According to Reuters, uh, this includes desktops, smartphones, tablets, game consoles, and over-the-top boxes. The system will launch in 2015 with ESPN, Turner Broadcasting, Sony's Crackle, Viacom, and Univision already signed up. Um, so is this a thing where they're going to be doing the population to estimate uh, all of these, all of this uh, viewing, or do they have some secret technology that's going to be embedded in uh, everything we do? Well, the, I'm the part the part with Adobe has to do with the ad tracking. Uh, the part with Nielsen could include some diaries and, and stuff. But but really, what what's significant to me about this story is that you see more and more uh, of the ratings company that advertisers rely on saying we're going to get you some numbers right we are going we are going to find a way to track these eyeballs because one of the reasons you haven't seen more major video online is monetization wasn't there they're like yeah if somebody watches our tv show on the internet it doesn't count we don't get to charge f the, f the advertiser for those ratings it's surprising that it's taking so long i mean we are in a similar similar ish situation in france and it could have started being counted a while ago already. Um, yeah, apparently Adobe can track viewers down to the IP level. So, yeah, they're, they're yeah, spying on you. pretty accurate. Uh, the Verge reports that the best features of music service Songza, including its smart playlist creation, will now be a part of Google Play Music on Android, iOS, and the web. Google acquired Songza back in July, if you remember. An update today will add a version of Songza's concierge service, offering a colorful list of activities, like you can have a working out playlist or a sleeping playlist, which you're sleeping, so I'm not sure why you'd want that. I guess it's to put you to sleep. Studying, uh, calling Comcast, etc. Designed to match your activities and mood, the feature is available only to all access subscribers. That's Google All Access. But there are no ads, so that's a plus there. A Play Music representative said it's, quote, business as usual for the standalone Songs app. So they're not killing the standalone app either, which is good. I'm. Uh, have you used uh, Songza? Uh, because I'm. I'm wondering how it is different from uh, Spotify's uh, curated activity playlists. From what I've read um, of people who use Songza, they're like it's much better. It's this is this is much more this is much more okay. suited to the needs. But those are Songza enthusiasts, so maybe they just say that because they already like the service. I don't know. It reminds me more of the Beats thing, where Beats has those yeah. mood playlists. Yeah, but the thing is, for for beats, uh, it is um, actually curated. It's not an. Uh, it's a mix of algorithm and curation, and they actually have people behind it, and that's how they explain it. Uh, how they explain it's better. I'm not sure it's how it works in the case of Songza. I'm guessing it's a concierge. It's a French word. Oh, oh, all right, all right. So it's actually a concierge who's handcrafting your playlists right. for every person involved. <laughs> he sits and looks at pictures of you and that's, reads that's, about your childhood. <laughs> <laughs> Good deal. Yeah. Uh, all right. Everyone, you can relax now. The continuity <sighs> of our future timeline is assured. There will be a working hoverboard available for purchase in time for the Back to the Future, oh my God, it's the future deadline next year. GigaOM <laughs> reports that a California startup called ArxPax 
<laughs> I just want to make sure I, I got it right. ArxPax has created a board called the Hendo, which, uh, which can hover three quarters of an inch above the ground, but only on certain types of metals uh, capable of generating a magnetic field like copper. And it definitely won't work on water. So, you know, continuity is almost preserved. Um, oh, yeah, and it will cost uh, 10 grand. Yeah. So the company's ultimate goal <laughs> is, to, is to create a small white box that can add hovering uh, capabilities to anything in your home, office, or museum. So um, hovering Mona Lisa coming in 2015. <laughs> so the thing is, the hovering Mona Lisa would have to be hovering over a sheet of metal at least right it, it yeah. needs to have the metal to repel the mag mag the magnet where these things are going the they'll need field, roads so. right they will need metal roads yeah <laughs> so i'm not sure exactly how and i'm i'm wondering i mean everyone has been exploded exploding uh, about this on twitter and everywhere else everywhere else i'm wondering how much of this is you know we have seen uh, magnetic field repulsion uh, hovering before. I mean, I mean, little pen toys that hover over their stand and yeah. things like that. How is it just? Be isn't it just because they made it into a ho hoverboard and and show that it kind of worked? Is it? How, I'm struggling. It's, it's the second works. part that's the trick, right? Having the mm. hoverboard actually work. I, I think that's you know. I think that's what catches yeah. people's eyes. Mm. It makes an awesome sound, too. Yeah. All right. Do you have pants on? I never have pants on. Well, put some on and hold on to them, people. Yahoo beat expectations in their Q3 earnings report announced today. TechCrunch reported that Yahoo, with sales of $1.09 billion, excluding traffic acquisition costs and non-gap earnings per share of $0.52, cents. Revenues, Woo. including acquisition costs, were $1.15 billion. Analysts were expecting, on average, non-GAAP earnings per share of $0.30 cents on XTAC sales of $1.04 billion. Yahoo's stock is up more than 4% right now in after-hours trading. Now, what's Yahoo going to do with their $5 billion in Alibaba cash? The stockholders are like, right here, please. Just put it in my pockets, because I have pants. <laughs> and that's why I uh, regret not having pants as well. Yeah, no money for you. Yeah. Recode uh, reports HP will demonstrate a new product called Sprout at an event in New York on October 29. According to people who've seen it, the product combines a large flat screen display with a flat touch enabled work surface and an overhead assembly that combines a projector and a 3D scanner. The overhead device projects images downwards onto the work surface, which users can manipulate with their hands or with a stylus. I just, it feels like <laughs> this before. It feels like, it, like somebody at H. Well, we'll see. We'll see what they actually announce. All right. Yeah. Let's let's not let's yeah, not yeah. trash a product before we even know mm -hmm. what it is. Because this is this is a scoop. This is an early rumor. Whatever. But it, this description from Recode makes it sound like somebody sat in a boardroom and said, "What would make a really impressive demo?" Like I'm not sure what to make <laughs> of this in real life. Hmm. I mean, we've seen prototypes of somewhat similar things a few times, but it feels like something that you would look at in a movie and think, wow, that's the future, yeah. but would be actually kind of impractical. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's what this strikes me as. Like I said, let's wait till October 29th, see what they come out with. Time for some news from you. These are a selection of items submitted at our subreddit. What? You haven't been to the subreddit yet. Go there now, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. And for those of you who are like, no, what are you talking about? I have been to the subreddit. Well, thank you. Thank you for going there and submitting stories and voting on the stories as well. Kyle is our janitor on the subreddit, self-described. He calls himself the janitor because uh, he keeps the spam like almost invisible. I don't know how he does it. He think he's a magician. Anyway, Kyle pointed out a life hacker post about what will end up being our main discussion story today. Google is implementing a new second factor authentication scheme called Security Key, which allows you to use a universal second factor key like a UB key to log into your Google accounts. The key uses the open FIDO framework to authenticate you rather than having you type in numbers from an authenticator because those could theoretically be fished. In other words, you stick a special USB key in your device and press a button, boom, you log in. For now, Security Key only works with Chrome. We're going to talk a little more about that in a bit. 
Captain Kipper submitted a TechCrunch article reporting that Microsoft will drop Nokia branding from its Windows phones. The phones will now be called phones. The rebranding will begin in France and move around the world. I think it's going to propagate because if it moves, then it won't be in France. Oh, right. It does propagate. That's a good point. Uh, that means the name Nokia will only be used by Nokia, uh, which still exists as a mapping and network technology company. I believe there they will be uh, allowed to build smart uh, phones again in two years, and maybe it's longer for smartphones. But I believe the name Nokia Nokia is going to come back to them uh, yeah. ultimately. Right. In well, this the was the first step, right? And there was a little hiccup in your internet. Microsoft Lumia will be the names of the Lumia phones now, if people didn't quite catch that. And that means that the Nokia name isn't used by Microsoft. And then the next step, like Patrick says, is eventually Nokia gets the right to use that name back, and eventually they get the right to do whatever they want. They have a, we won't make smartphones and compete with our old handset division for a period of time as part of the deal, but that deal won't last forever. Yeah. Hometown Rivals submitted the iMore story that Apple has responded to a Washington Post story co-written by future FTC chief technologist Ashken Sultani, by the way. Uh, the story pointed out that OS X Yosemite's Spotlight search sends data back to Apple by default. Apple said, we limit what data is collected. We do not attach it to an IP address or any kind of persistent identifier. And Apple points out you can opt out of Spotlight suggestions, Bing, or location services for Spotlight any time you wish through your preferences. It's it's really, I mean, it's for suggestions. So I think it's reasonably uh, expected. It's reasonable to expect that they would send data. But the, the even more important things uh, thing there is that you can opt out of it completely and quite easily. It's just a setting in the settings. Um, so I, I don't think there's a... a, a story there in the sense of uh, outrage story. Mark, by just, the way, Mark Shuttleworth at Ubuntu is just looking at this, shaking his head like, he should have talked to me first. I could have saved a lot of pain on this one. Because <laughs> they, they went through all of this already. Yeah, I, I mean, that Apple's even stealing its controversies now from Linux. But um, ching. <laughs> just kidding. All right, that's a look at the headlines. <laughs> All right, let's talk about this uh, YubiKey thing, because when I suggested this to Patrick as a story today, I was very positive about it. I was like, look, this is great. You just, uh, in fact, my wife who works for Google has this already because that's what they use for their corporate security. A lot of enterprises use it for corporate security where to authenticate that you're really the person logging into the corporate network, you put in the YubiKey and everything happens on the YubiKey, right? So you don't have to type anything in. It's public key encryption, etc. And they're now making this available for anybody. You have to go buy the device yourself. It's like an $18 key that you can purchase anywhere. You can buy one on Amazon or wherever. Uh, and then you pair it with your two-factor authentication on Google. Right now, it only works with Chrome, but it's an open framework, Fido. So other browsers can implement it, things like Firefox, etc. cetera. Uh, and other companies hopefully will get on board thanks google they, they would like this to become widespread but then patrick you you said when we were talking about this you're like i'm not so sure well it's the thing is i'm not really sure why this is better than existing solutions and i understand technically why it's better you know, it's actually on a theoretical level more secure, and it's it's less uh, uh, subject to potential attacks and phishing and all of this. But when we're talking about phishing for these um, for the existing uh, two-factor authentication authenticators, like the Google Authenticator that you can use with multiple services, um, it's uh, something that needs to be phished and used within a few dozen seconds, probably. Um, it's the window for for because these codes are you know they they're tied to a, an algorithm and and a, a tied a, a, a server and a time synchronized time thing anyway, and and they're valid for a very short amount of time so twenty seconds more or less or but thirty. But that's all it takes, man. If but you click on a phishing link and you think you're at Google and you're not and you give put in your password and you put in your authenticator, that script automatically logs itself into your account with a valid credential, and then it can go turn two-factor authentication off. I agree. Um, in theory, again, the YubiKey type thing. Oh, by the way, YubiKey, I believe Yubi is for finger. 
uh, oh. because it's a Japanese thing name for thing. So oh, I think nice. That's why it is. Yeah. Um, anyway, so in theory, I, I understand that the um, security keys are safer, but um, it, you also have to weigh it against the other um, inconvenience of actually having to have the authentic the authenticator with you all the time, and the fact that if you don't have it, you simply cannot log in if you're not at a, a previously uh, safe. Uh, determined as safe location and of course the authenticator you have to have it as well but since it's in your phone it's I think much more likely that you will have it with you and we're not talking about a uh, third-party service like you know let's say a uh, gaming service for which you need an authenticator as well where if you can't log in well you know you can't play but it's not the end of the world but not being able to log into your Google account might be well, an okay. actual I, I, I feel you on that. Like, you're going to have to carry this thing with you. But also, you can't get into your house if you don't have your key. And you don't see everyone rushing to turn their house locks into phone-enabled locks because they have their phone with them. I mean, this is something you can carry around with you. And fair enough, if you lose it, that's a bad thing, right? Just like losing your phone mm -hmm. is a bad thing. And maybe because it's smaller and because you don't use it all the time, you're more likely to lose it. There are They do suggest that you actually register two keys. You can buy two keys, keep one mm -hmm. safe. So if you do lose the second one, you can de-authenticate that one and, and use your spare. Like there's, there's ways around that. I guess my question is how unsafe is the existing solution now that is exactly right? the right think, question to ask right it's yeah. conve it's always convenience versus security when you say that sometimes you have people on the security side saying well you know do you, what what price is your security and like you said it depends on on what you're logging into if this is your financial information you're going to want to put up with a lot of inconvenience if you're talking about logging into elo right now i'm not really <laughs> You know, I'm not really worry, wanting to put up with a lot of inconvenience. But here's the thing. If you can keep this thing like tied to your phone, or there can be an implementation that would use NFC on your phone, mm. uh, and maybe that could work somehow with a computer or something like that. That's not in the framework right now. But there, if, if you could make it so that like this is normal, like you always have this key with you, just like your house keys, mm. and and then all you have to now it's easier because i don't have to pull out a phone and open an authenticator app i don't have to pull out a separate dongle i don't even have to have a phone i don't have to type in anything because the hey way Dad, this can you loan oh, me a buck, sorry please? yeah yeah sure i can loan you a buck okay. later um, <laughs> uh, some people disagree with you tom all and the I children agree with our disagreement uh, no, so, um, so here, but, but but let me finish that that sentence, and I'll let yeah, you talk, sure, sure. Um, and let the children talk. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the thing is, like, I log in, right? Name, password, plug in a USB key, and press a button. Done. I'm done. It's actually easier and more secure because it's public key encryption, and the authentication happens on the chip. It's not in a place where something could be fished. It makes sure, like, am I actually talking to Google? Yes, I am. Okay, good. Then I'm going to authenticate you. So I understand, I mean, there are words coming out of your mouth, and I understand <laughs> all of the words that you're saying, and they make sense, and I put them together in my brain, <laughs> and they make sense, right? Uh, I still, and, and I'm almost convinced, there's still a part of my brain that thinks, so I'm using LastPass, and I'm randomizing my passwords and everything, and you still have people, when I'm doing that, with a two-factor authentication, by the way, through the, the, the um, Google Authenticator, and even then, I still have people who are telling me, well, you know, you still have this one password for LastPass, which is sort of unsafe. Or, or, yeah. You know, it's the, I guess there are two things I'm wondering. The, it, it, aren't there potential points of failure for this system as well? Sure. And also, how much of it is the, the, the isn't at some point the security good enough that we don't necessarily need to go farther if it's a little bit inconvenient? And, well, and I understand and that oh, ulti ultimately, I think you convinced me. So I'm playing devil's advocate now. I think I would like to have this key that I keep with my keys that I always have with me, especially if there's you know NFC there. Um, but yeah, the, the, the two remaining questions are still there. I, I think that's a very good question. I think it is the right question to ask. 
it's a people don't want to raise that question of is this worth the inconvenience because it almost sounds if you're a security professional like you're advocating irresponsibility you know you're telling yeah. people ah don't worry about it that much right and that's that that is not true if you want to give out in general to the masses the most secure advice then you would say always use two factor authentication right but if you're talking individually to a sensible person mm -hmm. that you know can think for themselves right like you and I are talking then you want to say like well yeah you probably don't need two factor authentication on every single account that's overkill right you might want it on the accounts that would be the most damaging uh because it is it is a little more of an inconvenience on the other hand Here's where I'm going with this. It's a little less convenient than not having two-factor authentication. I think YubiKey is actually more convenient than using an authenticator app or even an authenticator fob uh, that gives you a one-time code that you put in because you don't have to put in that code. You just put in the authenticator key. Uh, I, and I, I, I use one myself and it's, it's really simple. However, what would be better is if you didn't have to use that at all, right? And that's UAF. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, that UAF is part of the FIDO framework where you, a UAF stack is installed on a client device, say your phone, then you present local biometric or maybe a PIN or maybe an eye scan to register and authenticate. In fact, Knock Knock Labs uh, has a multi-factor authenticator that integrates with FIDO and Touch ID. Touch ID and FIDO don't get along, but the, and this one from Knock Knock Labs will unify the two so that on my phone, at least, I don't have to put in a password at all. I've already pre-authenticated. I know it's me. I have a, I have a secure uh, stack that's making sure to use public key encryption, and I'm using my you know, and I'm using my thumb to log in. Right. So, is that 100% secure? No, but that is more secure than not having two-factor authentication, and it can be done on the device. If you can do that on my desktop now as well, if you could do that on my laptop as well, if you can get browsers to support it, we could be moving towards a world where all of this ridiculous password management starts to go away. And that's a future I would like to explore. I don't think we're there yet, but this to me is so heartening because it's a step on popularizing this so that people get used to it and go, oh, okay, YubiKey, I'm used to that. And now when they say, well, now it's built in to your device, you know, oh, okay, it's just not, I don't have to actually stick the thing in there anymore, great. Yeah, I'd, I'd be uh, up for that, for sure. And I mean, even the YubiKey, as long as when I stick it into the, the USB port, it doesn't install for 15 minutes and try to find the thing. No, because there's no anything. drivers, no software. That's the best part about it. All of that so, happens in the browser. If, the, if Chrome is built oh, so to handle it, it just looks at the key and goes, oh, okay, that's your public key. Great, thanks. Boom. So, so Chrome uh, is built to to see the USB port directly, and it doesn't need any driver. It's built, it's built to recognize else? the YubiKey, yeah. Right, right. But I mean, the the computer itself doesn't need to to, to do something to recognize the YubiKey. No, it doesn't need to install drive. Okay, well then, you know, I think uh, it might indeed be interesting, and if that paves the way for something even better, which is this uh, arcane UAF thing you've been talking about, uh, I can get on board. All right, now we will wait for the emails to tell us what we missed. <laughs> uh, but that no, it's good. I think I think it's great that Google's doing this. You know, I don't want to uh, be a Google fanboy here. We should also point out that Duo Security announced uh, authentication support for UTF today as well. They're an enterprise level security firm. Uh, they have a ton of big clients. Uh, that's almost a bigger announcement than Google because it's going to put a lot more of this in implementation uh, across devices. But it's great for consumers that Google is doing this now not just for their corporate center but but for you as a regular user and it's it to be fair it's it's usually that kind of thing that starts is it, it's like apple doing apple pay this could start and and google has been incredibly influential in the browser uh, uh, space so it could completely start a, a, a radical movement um, for security in general so yeah that's that, that would be good uh, let's take a look at the calendar. Tomorrow, Wednesday, October 22nd, is Twitter's mobile development conference in San Francisco. I think it's their first mobile developer conference called Twitter Flight, which certainly doesn't sound at all like Twitter Fight or Twitter Fright, because <laughs> it is October. Uh, and tomorrow, we get earnings from AT&T and Yelp.
Our pick of the day is appropriately enough an authenticator, the G Auth authenticator. Uh, this one comes from Stephen Funkhauser. Uh, he says, I agree with your skepticism about using a tool like Authy that syncs your second factor authentication keys between machines. Security and convenience are always at odds, as we were just talking about. And in this case, we don't know enough about Authy. Uh, to trust them blindly. So I personally use GAuth Authenticator as a Chrome extension. There's a Firefox one available as well. It's open source with a public repo on GitHub. It stores your key data locally, so only you have it. I also like to back up the text version of my second factor keys in LastPass in the notes section under each account record. Thanks for a wonderful and insightful podcast. Oh, well, that's very nice of you, Stephen. So there you go. There's If you're not using YubiKey or you need to use an authenticator for a bunch of other sites that don't use YubiKey, uh, you might want to check out GAuth Authenticator for Firefox and or Chrome. The only problem I see there is that you need to be in front of your computer um, to use the authenticator, right? Well, that so was the you... uh, that was the the complaint that we were responding to, right? Was the people mm -hmm. like, well, I don't want to use my phone for that, or I don't have oh, a phone. Right, right, it's right. like, well, here you go. Here's another uh, here's another authenticator that you can right. use. Send your picks to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com, and you can find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com/picks. We should get a picks section together for you, Patrick. I didn't think about mm -hmm. that until just now. Send me some I, picks. I, I will uh, strive to get more picks. Oh, by the way, one of my, I, I guess you, you discussed it before, but one of my uh, all-time favorite picks, uh, um, Alien Blue, which is an, a Reddit client for iPad, uh, and which I was advocating for um, Reddit to buy, has been they listened to you. Bought last week. Very happy. I don't know if they listened to me, but they <laughs> saw the greatness that I described right. as well. <laughs> Our messages of the day. We got three of them. Uh, let's get through them here. The first one comes from Stephen in Melbourne, Australia, with a plea. Hey, Tom, Jenny, and awesome guest. This is Stephen from Melbourne, Australia. In regards to Apple Pay, Australia's been set up for Apple Pay for quite a few years. We've had NFC at nearly all cash registers in petrol stations, convenience stores, supermarkets. The banks all support chip and pin in all the credit cards, I think except for American Express, which don't seem to have chips in their cards. So launch Apple Pay in Australia, Apple, and um, you'll have lots of people using their new iPhone 6s and 6 Pluses. Thanks. Yeah, just having yeah, NFC-capable terminals doesn't, doesn't make Apple Pay work, does it? And it's uh, it's also assuming he's saying uh, launch Apple Pay in Australia and you'll have lots of people using Apple Pay. It, that assumes that there are lots of people in Australia, <laughs> or that Australia <laughs> is a real country, and that you're not just imagining it, Stephen. Uh, Tony B said, "I've been using Google Wallet for I, a while I love now." Australia, sorry, I, know, I, don't, I don't mean to. Yes. Uh, Tony B wants to wants to put in a vote for Google Wallet. Uh, I talked about the first time I used Google Wallet and how it didn't work perfectly out of the gate, although it worked okay, and how Apple Pay just worked ridiculously perfectly out of the gate yesterday. Tony B says, I've been using Google Wallet for a while now, and I love it. I started using it to help budget money as I could just transfer funds from my checking account to my wallet balance. I pay with NFC on my Moto X at the local grocery store, and it works quickly and easily. For vendors that don't support NFC payments, I have my physical Google Wallet card. I even pay my rent by transferring money from my account to my landlord's. You have a cool landlord. Uh, thanks, Tony. Tony B. Yeah, you know what? I actually uh, have one of those Google Wallet cards as well. I never think to use it, though. I have a problem. Google yeah. Wallet doesn't work for me for some reason. It's a personal problem. It's user error. I think it's... I'm sure. Well, it, it is... I don't think you can say it's user error in this case. Um, there's a lot of... It works a lot for a lot of people, I'm sure, but there is this... Again, it has to be better what is it than what is already in place in order for it to take off uh, uh, in the consumer space in general. And I don't think Google Wallet has reached that level of convenience yet. Well, uh, Tony would disagree people. with you. Tony's saying, well, look, man, I just pull my Moto X at the grocery store and boom, I pay and I'm gone. I understand, but I think it works for him. I'm not sure explaining all of this would work for a regular a regular person, mm -hmm. right. um, you know, I mean, you have to set it up and then you have, if it doesn't work, you have the card, then you also have to have the thing that has NFC and that has, and I understand Apple Pay is kind of the same, 
but it's it's got that extra layer of acceptance and and uh, universality and marketing it's a little it. well it's there's that it's also a little quicker because it doesn't have to process the payment google wallet yeah. is not just the token it's also the storage of your value right yeah. uh and that makes a difference um sometimes for tony though apparently it doesn't make a difference enough to yeah. ma to matter right here's one for you though mr apple pay fan John Nooncaster says, okay, I was listening to you and Jenny with your new tax accounting with Tom and Jetty in the post show yesterday. How do you get a refund if you want to return an item bought with Apple Pay if there's no identifiable information? Now, I've got my receipt from Apple Pay here, right right here, right? So that's, that's fine. This receipt looks just like any other receipt. It doesn't have my real credit card number. Uh, it only has the last four numbers, but it, it, it does it does exist, right? So I can show them the receipt, show them the product. The, the trick is, how are they going to know what credit card to refund to? And my I think guess, Mike, you got a guess? Uh, well, I would say you need to uh, find the transaction in your Apple Pay history somewhere to justify it. I think if you've got the paper receipt and I say, I don't like these three oranges, I want to return them. <laughs> Uh, I I think but you just you, something else, right? You, yeah, you show them the product, and you show them the receipt, and then they say, "Do you have the card that you used to buy it?" You say, "No, I used Apple Pay." Then probably, I'm just guessing here, mm. and if this isn't true, this is the way it should work. They have a system that says, "Oh, okay, well, uh, authenticate your Apple Pay," and then you'd get you'd get the same procedure as buying something. It would say, "Would you like to Would you like to uh, use Apple Pay?" And you'd press your thumb down, and then they would refund you the money that way. Mm -hmm. So that's your card. Hmm. Yeah, probably. It should be. It's an interesting question. And yeah, I'm not uh, not sure. I'm sure we're going to, you know, discover a bunch of inconveniences with Apple Pay as well. There is there it's a new and different system as, you know, uh, with all of these contactless payment things, there are things that need to be worked out. So, not so much of a fan of Apple Pay on principle. I just yeah. want to, you know, all right. put it out at there. Out yeah, because I just accused you of being one, so yeah, that's that's fair. Yeah. Well, thank you, Patrick Bejad. Uh, Patrick is on at least once a week, usually on Tuesdays. Twitter.com slash notpatrick to follow him and frenchspin.com to find his other podcasts. Yes, frenchspin.com is currently in um, uh, under construction, as we would say in the 90s on the web. Uh <laughs> I, I switched my French shows to Frenchspin.fr. Okay. And uh, Frenchspin.com is probably going to see stuff happening very soon. So, yeah. Uh, so, sure. yeah, check it out. Frenchspin.fr if you want the French ones or Frenchspin.com to see what's coming soon. I know a little bit about what's coming soon and it's cool. <laughs> so, you just better bookmark that. Book, since we're talking 90s, bookmark that <laughs> in your Netscape browser. <laughs> Uh, thank you to our patrons, 4,456 of you getting us within $600 of being able to bring another contributor on, Mr. Justin Robert Young. Uh, so thank you to all of you who've upped your donations lately. Uh, you guys are amazing. I'm blown away every time I see that on Twitter, somebody saying, hey, I, I want Justin on the show. I've upped my donation. Really super appreciate that. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash donate to find the link to our Patreon or any of the other ways to support the show. Don't forget, you can have a voice in what stories we cover at our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. You can email us. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Our phone number is 512-59-DAILY. That's 512-593-2459. And you can listen to the show live at mobile.alphageekradio.com or check out the in-beta alphageekvideo.com as well. Our website is dailytechnewsshow.com. We'll be back with Eric Franklin, co-host of CNET's The Fix and section editor for How To and Tablets. See you tomorrow. about this and other shows, visit frogpants.com. Audio program so good, it's like you're there. Addendum. Sebgon says from Apple support, the cashier can use the device account number to find the purchase and process the return, just like they would with a traditional card or debit card payment. To see the last four digits of the device account number, go to Passbook, tap the card, and tap I. Problem solved. Boom. Thank you, Sebgons. Good research. Communicator, Paul Gannon. Actually, I was very much a uh, Netscape communicator user. I liked to use uh, Netscape uh, communicator edit 
to work on my web pages because it was fast, even though it messed with the <laughs> when, code. When, when's the first time you built a website? 1996. Wow. I think you... Go, wait, do you have... What? Me what? Beat. Street Fighter Alpha released. What? Street Fighter Alpha, because I had a... You did a fan a site? Yeah, a fan site about, like, translations of... 95! Holy crap! I mean, poop. <laughs> I didn't um, build so I web pages. I, I was strictly on Usenet uh, before 1996. Oh. See, I was using Minitel. Ah, well, not 1996. I, I eschewed guess. the graphical web. Like, <laughs> look, if I want to go to the web, I can use links. Why do I need to get a browser and pay ridiculous prices for a non-shell account? A shell account gets me everything I need. Gets me everything I need, man. That was 25-year-old Tom Merritt talking right there. <laughs> uh, I remember when I, I first saw a web page. It was magical. Yeah. It was in 1992 on Mosaic uh, at university. It was amazing. And I, My I, first web page, I think, was in 94, and it was IMDb. I remember that. I didn't, I, I didn't believe it was actually uh, distant, you know, not local images being loaded. It was just mind-blowing. Yeah. And then once I actually, I gave up my $9 a month CCSI shell account and went for a, a, an actual uh, 26.6, I think, modem is what I had. Uh, and, um, or 26.8, what is it? It was 14.4. 28.28.6. 28.6, there we go. Um, it wasn't a 14.4, it was, it was a 28.6. And then I, um, and then I actually created my, my first website in 1996. So you what can was find it, it if you go to subbrilliant.com slash your pag 2html I have preserved it, although the images are all broken now. Subbrilliant.com slash your pag 2 y o u r p a g 2.html. Ooh, this is exciting. <laughs> Oh, so brilliant has two L's. Yes, two B's, two L's. Wow, that is a web page. Now, it used to have a brick background. <laughs> <laughs> and then that broken image in the middle was a word that I had turned into an image so that it would stand out. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so what's it about? It's uh, parody so news. It was the parody news. news zine that I had done and then converted into a Usenet group. And this was its mm -hmm. third incarnation as a website. Interesting. Do I still have my old stuff? I did find one of my tripod sites had been preserved at archive.org. We were, we were looking at this stuff in the chat room after the show a while back. Tripod sites? Yeah. Did you ever use tripod? So it was like GeoCities. Mm -hmm. It's actually still around. It's oh. a B two B site now. Okay. No. Uh, yeah. So GeoCities, when it went away, they didn't capture a lot of them for some reason. Uh, but tripod, they did. Hmm. Wait, I I found my old site in no kidding. HTML. I have it. On, well, it's not on the web. Oh, you oh. found it locally, though? You yeah. Have a copy of it on your... Oh, it's so fancy. <laughs> I have, like, tables and, and, and images and... Wow. Wait, can I share this? We need a title, too. Oh, right. Yes, there's work. But while you figure out sharing, Jenny, do we have a consensus title? Well, I love Seb Gonza's title, Where We're Going, We'll Need Roads. <laughs> Metal Roads. <laughs> that was, by the way, Jenny's joke that she had written and then I'd taken out and then I stole. So I just want to give her credit for that. It's cool. 
we also have Hoverboard, B-O-R-E-D, from BioCow. Uh, I'm also a fan of BioCow's Yahoo Beats Expectations. 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 <laughs> Warms my cold, dead heart a little bit. That's pretty uh, good, too. <laughs> and uh, Fido the Key, key retriever, retriever. yeah. From yeah. Tinvac. Google's new security is fabulous. Fabulous. I like yeah. that one. I saw that one go by. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. I, I love a good pun. Um, Patrick, do you have a favorite? Honestly, I think I like where we're going. We'll need roads. All right. But, Let's um, do it. Yeah. Because obviously we're not getting flying cars by 2015 in any usable capacity. Yeah, that's true. But the, I think the, the hoverboard is the only one that actually matters. Yeah, it's true. They need so, power. It's not you, Patrick. It's your kids. So wait, if I if I share my... My um, it gives you a choice, I think, about whether you want to share a window or the, your whole screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to make sure I'm not doing. Yeah, I know. Silly. Right. Here's my home address and my bank account number <laughs> and my French social security number and all of that. Um, I am exporting files. The files will export in approximately 28 seconds. Why are you a robot? I don't know. Why would robots talk like that? That's the other <laughs> question. Did you see the robot that is um, uh, uh, playing in a... Would you want to support independent project? <laughs> That's playing what? Uh, playing a, uh, he was an actor in a play. Oh, yes. Was, I marked that for Current Geek, there. actually. Oh, like okay. That's a good one. You know I what? have current I geek. Current geek. <laughs> Scott Johnson um, is looking for someone who's available to be on current geek on Friday. He's probably going to hate that. I said that a bunch of people he doesn't want. will email him. <laughs> um, this Friday. Yeah. What time? Mm, late for you. Uh, it's 4 p.m. Pacific. Late. So like two I'm, hours from now. Two hours from now. Oh wow! So it's one a.m. Yeah. for me. Mm. Super late. Because I'm. Um, you want to be doing other things at one a.m. on a Friday, like drinking. I would imagine. In a you do that and do curry. If That's you're gonna be curry. awake. <laughs> I'm gonna be at a not, in Switzerland, so we don't have to be super responsible on curry. Um. Yeah. No. 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 It's it's way late. But um. Yeah. Probably not. Okay. Can I do this? Keep feeling fascination. I think I just put my old website online. Whoa. You republished after all these years? Yes. Everybody wants to know about autopilot. Yep, it'll come back. I was just typing Fred. <laughs> It was, was seasonal. Sad. Every I'm sad. Remember how long you had to wait between those two seasons of Breaking Bad? Yeah, Boy. it's like that, except not as good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, nothing's oh, as good as Breaking. Why is it not working? Index.html. Did you overwrite Frenchbin.com with it? <laughs> <laughs> no. I wonder Not if Recode is still down. Recoding. Recode all was working for me. It's weird. All my sites worked fine, and Recode wouldn't load, and it's still not. Oh, no. Now it's loading slowly. Ooh, I see. Of course, because you said something about it. Yeah. I was like, ooh, did they get capitalization? Bubbled? But I think what you wrote there still was not great. loading for me. You, could, you can just like leave out some of that tack Yeah, see, my stuff. issue is because I'm dumb when it comes to money and earnings and Wall Street stuff, which is why I'm probably no longer employed at Yahoo. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, I understand in theory what, I, I don't understand it enough, the Wall Street earnings things, to be able to take things out, to be able to substantively reduce it to a simple, nice sentence, other but, than hold on to your pants, they beat earnings. 
Right. If you say, hold on to the pants and beat earning, this was their revenue, this was their earnings per share, and you did yeah. the right thing because they said, this is their non-gap and this is their non-gap, you leave when that they, in. See, like, when they break it down like that, it's hard for me to find... I was looking for the recode thing and I wouldn't load, but yeah. it's just it's one of those that things that like I don't intuitively know it well enough to simplify it into something that's human Gotcha. Uh, instead of Wall street -ese. Human. There is no human on Wall Street. Oh, no. Right. That's right. I have the rich. <laughs> I have my site. It's online. I'm very excited. Oh, where do we go? Where do we go? Where do we go? Wait. I'm going to put it in the chat room. Is that right? Yes. Right. This is the first website I ever built. Street Fighter Zero homepage. Ooh, and your background yes. works. So it looks... Uh, yes. that's a, that's a, I probably went to this site. This looks so familiar. Like, just... <laughs> it's so of its time. That's awesome. Yeah, isn't it? And look at all like the images and uh -huh. like there's street like technical wow. sheet and like the image the titles like to know more about the game, which is like super well rendered. Alan Kim's <laughs> F and Q <laughs> Official Japanese name lists. I was this studying is Japanese. So nineteen ninety five. But isn't it's, it? it's really good for nineteen ninety five, right? <laughs> Like it's not Ricky. a ton of animated gifs. There's no blink tags. Like it's just it's like a well designed page of its time. It's awesome. Oh, I I was studying Japanese and I did the official Japanese names. I, I was distributing this on uh, on um, on the news groups, and uh -huh. so I have like the pronunciation for all the names of the moves in Japanese, and like I had so much time to to waste. That's anyway. awesome. So there you go. This is my first web page. And I have a web counter counter as well, which doesn't work. Oh, I think mine still works. Really? Yeah. Um, I don't know if it was on that your peg because I don't think I'd added it yet. But if you go to sobrilliant.com slash news, and then you click on one of the older archive pages, like 2007 maybe. No, go back to, you have to go back to 93. Yeah, down in the bottom left, there's a site Ooh. meter. <laughs> Total page views of 372,994. Average per day, one. That is some hardcore stuff. Sightme.com so is still around. That's crazy. For appreciating this effort. Thanks, Taxi Cab. That's the other thing I would have put in now that the Wall Street Journal has put theirs out is about the mobile sales uh, numbers that they put out for the first time and that it was, you know, a small number, but they project a bigger number, you know, like mobile and, and also that, that's That's like the down. icing. Like that yeah. would have been great to have that. I don't feel bad that it wasn't there. But yeah, you're identifying the right like push it up yeah. a notch kind of thing. I mean, those are it's so funny because this is actually the one company I know. Yeah. Display was down five percent. Oh no! That's well, because the big serious. the big thing you ident the big thing was the cash. Like, what are you guys going to do with the cash, Marissa? Because yeah. we want you've got all this cash, and we don't think you're spending it right with all your yeah. acquisitions. Um, so yeah, still a Marissa Meyer fan, you know, and that's saying something. Today's a big moment for her. <laughs> mm -hmm. See. I told you it could work. No, I'm I'm being Marissa Meyer. <laughs> uh, you know right. what? She showed up uh, on a tennis court in our Santa Monica office, like eight months pregnant, and spoke because like some bigger conference room inside was booked by some massive event. Talked to us for two hours and answered like everybody's questions. And I just thought, all right, I buy in. So that's my yeah. Marissa Meyer insight for today. So. If you want to win Jenny over, you have to speak to her for two hours on a tennis court, is what this while means. Pregnant. Yeah, while pregnant. First of all, step one, get pregnant. <laughs> step two, find a tennis court. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, what else uh, is going on? What else I on? think I just published the podcast, but I forgot to check and make sure it was working right. Okay, it works. The Daily Tech News Show.
Why is Lathan? Thanks, Big Jim. Um, hey, thanks, Sam, for me, Big Jim. Oh, my gosh. Hope you're still in there. <laughs> that was a dangerous sounding open. Um, oh, I'm taking over the post. Can I do it? Uh, yeah. Hold on a second. Yeah, go ahead. It's yes, all... 10 from Chicago is right. Marissa saved community. And that's still also pretty impressive. So, well, Big Jim, then you're not going to be able to uh, win Jenny over if you're not going to get pregnant. Just saying. <laughs> I believe the statement that you can take out of that is if you try really hard to communicate to all your people when you first show up and you don't just sit in some office and proclaim things, but you really come down and you talk to all your people and you answer all your questions, then I like you, even if you lay me off. <laughs> there you go. That's our upbeat message of the day. Uh, bye video, folks. Hope you enjoyed this. We will see you soon.